In the celiac world, fewer names are more recognized worldwide than that of Dr. Alessio Fasano, a pediatric gastroenterologist. Dr. Fasano is chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition, Nutrition, director of the Center for Celiac Research and Treatment, associate chief for basic clinical and translational research, and head of the Mucosal Immunology and Biology Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He's also a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and a professor of nutrition at Harvard University. Dr. Fasano is widely sought after for his expertise in celiac disease, intestinal permeability, and autoimmune disorders. Dr. Fasano is the co-author of Gluten Freedom, published in 2014, and co-author with Susie Flaherty of Gut Feelings, The Microbiome and Our Health, published in March 2021. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Fasano. Thank you, Mark. And again, um, apologies for the technical issues that I had. So, um, it doesn't give me the chance to start my video. Um, and also I can't share if you don't stop sharing, uh, I guess your um, screen, right? Uh, Melissa, maybe we can stop sharing ours. So Dr. Fazano, yeah, you share. should be able to share right away. Okay, um, the, the video is still uh, not open because it's been blocked by you guys, but it doesn't matter. It, okay. You're not missing that much anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I was given this half an hour, you know, slot um, uh, to talk about um, the spectrum gluten related disorders, where we were, where we are, where we're going. So it's quite an ambition, half an hour, but we'll do our best to really squeeze everything in. Um, so, you know, until the recent past, the paradigm was you go gluten free only if you have celiac disease. And if celiac disease, has been ruled out, you have no business to embrace this diet. And then with increased awareness of what celiac disease is, of what gluten can do to your body that you heard you know, from you know, um, the video that we just heard and, and also the previous intervention and so on and so forth, it became very clear that that was a myopic and, and rather non you know, comprehensive uh, reflection of what you know, gluten can do to us um, as human beings. To the point in which now we got to the another stream. So there are two polarized sense. One that you know uh, the conservative folks they, they still maintain that gluten free is only for people with serious disease, and uh, and there is also a, a, another you know extreme you know group of individual that believes that everybody needs to go gluten free no matter who you are because otherwise we will pay a dear price as a, as a species a human species. Of course, the truth is somewhere in the middle. It is true that besides celiac disease, there are other conditions that will benefit to go gluten free. Uh, and here in this scheme, you know, in a very you know schematic way, they divided what is the landscape of consumers of gluten free product nowadays. The vast majority are occasional consumers that are you know using gluten free products not for medical necessity, like the case that we just heard, um, but just because of lifestyle. And, and we're not going to talk about this. On the other hand, you know, there are people that, again, as we heard, that they need to go gluten-free. It's not a choice. This is the way that they can treat their condition. And here we talk about now a spectrum of gluten-related disorders. Again, besides the disease has been the first and most, you know, commonly studied, you know, co condition related to um, uh, gluten ingestion. We know that there are at least another two entity. One is with allergy, and of course, you know, we can be, you know, um, um, allergic to many food stuff, including wheat, uh, with, a, with a prevalence that's uh, roughly 10 times less than celiac disease. And then this new, relatively new, not anymore, uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity or gluten sensitivity for short, or non-celiac non, uh, non wheat sensitivity, whatever you want to call it. There is another form of, of immune reaction to gluten, but it's not an autoimmune like celiac disease. Uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, you know, uh, because this is a relatively new entity, um, we have gone through a series of consensus conferences to try to understand what we're dealing with. And here are summarize, you know, the, the not, not in a nutshell, what we call cases of people with, with non celiac gluten sensitivity. These are people that react to ingestion gluten containing grains. Uh, and we know now that not necessarily just gluten, but other components of wheat may eventually trigger the symptoms in which both the allergic components of wheat allergy and the autoimmune component, I see that this has been 
that you know ruled out. We need, it's, it's mostly a diagnosis by exclusion criteria. Um, it, and it, 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 to go more in the granular details, that means that you know these are people that have symptoms that are triggered by ingestion gluten containing grains, that they have immune you know um, tests for allergy negative. They have the serology for seeded disease, including TTG that you heard and so on and so forth to be negative. Eventually they go on and they do an endoscopy to see if there's anything else. So they are falsely negative civic and then the endoscopy needs to be negative. Uh, now there is a lot of work trying to find and validate biomarkers, uh, first generation antigladin antibodies were the first ones to be tested, but now there are several people that are trying to figure out to do a positive diagnosis, not by exclusion. Uh, the presence, of course, of clinical symptoms that can overlap with celiac disease and with allergy. So the symptomatology, so the clinical presentation would not help us to distinguish among the different form of gluten reaction. And of course, last and definitely, you know, another criteria that needs to be satisfied is the resolution symptoms following the implementation of gluten-free diet and, you know, reuniting the symptoms with a gluten challenge. If we look at the list of the symptoms, uh, and you know, uh, compare that to the ones with celiac disease. You see that there is a lot of overlapping. As a matter of fact, you know, if you see in the right, the most common symptoms. Uh, um, um, uh, now I can start my video. Okay, so you can see me. Um, the most common symptom, you know, are the ones that are typical of of, of celiac disease. So there is a lot of overlapping with abdominal pain, diarrhea. Um, stomach ache and, and so on and so forth, but also the extraintestinal symptoms overlap very much with what we see in celiac disease: uh, lack of well-being, uh, to be tired, headache, anxiety, and so on and so forth, mind and so on and so forth. And you see, in other words, there is a lot of overlapping between the two forms, even if. Uh, and you see on the left of this slide that, for example, abdominal pain is much more frequent in non celiac gluten sensitive than celiac disease. Constipation is more frequent in celiac disease, and so on and so forth. But you know, the, the, the major limitation of the entire ordeal, if we look now at the entire landscape of the gluten related disorders in which we, as I was so told you, autoimmune, the celiac disease without a permutation, including gluten ataxia, and dermatitis periformis. Allergy, the with allergy of all its permutation, non the gluten sensitivity. The first two, we have biomarkers. So we can make a positive diagnosis. The, the third one, unfortunately, we don't have biomarkers that are validated yet. So remains as we speak, you know, a, a diagnosis of exclusion. But I believe that now, even if at the beginning there was a lot of skepticism, there is no doubt in the vast majority of experts in the field, so to speak, both scientists and clinicians. That this is an entity that exists and needs to be respected in terms of, you know, patients that they clearly see a cause-effect relationship between the exposure of gluten and the onset of symptoms. I'm going to shift to celiac disease because again, there is a lot that's going on here that I want to make sure that I have time to share with you guys. Uh, and and all this progress is really related to the fact that now we have a better understanding of the entire chain of events that leads to the onset of celiac disease in somebody that's genetically predisposed. We had some information, but there were some holes that now have been filled by recent science that help us to understand, you know, um, why some people uh, eventually genetically predisposed will lead to um, the brico tolerance gluten develop celiac disease that others may not. So uh, again, there is no doubt uh, this was disputed in the past that celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, but it's a one of a kind, very unusual. Like all autoimmune disease has the two key elements, the genetic predisposition, first peculiarity though, some of these genes, particularly this class HLA genes, DQ2 and DQ8, has a huge high penetrance. Uh, almost the totality of people with celiac disease, they are, have either one or both of these um, two genes. And that's unusual because, you know, there are other autoimmune diseases in which, you know, these genes are frequent, but not with such high penetrance. The autoantigens is known. So the, 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 this, this enzyme that's called tissue transglutaminase or TTG for short, to put the point that it's used uh, for diagnosis now. The environmental trigger is known, and that makes celiac disease a one-of-a-kind autoimmune disease because there is no other autoimmune disease in which we are aware of the environmental trigger, so much so 
that see that this is the only autoimmune disease that can be, you know, treated, not cure, treated uh, by implementing a gluten-free diet. Because by doing that, you know, all the autoimmune processes are shut down. Now, just to put this in a, you know, um, historical perspective, I want to remind to all of you guys that at the beginning, this was considered a pediatric condition with gastrointestinal symptoms that resemble a malabsorption syndrome. You see here a picture of kids in London in, in the late 30s, and they le look like malnourished kids, the ones that we see now for third world countries. That, that picture reflects not the fact that they were not eating, they were eating, you know, no problem. It reflects more the fact that despite that they were eating enough calories, they were not able to make use of them because they were completely, you know, lost um, because of the maldigestion, malabsorption of food. And therefore, this was what we consider always the typical CD disease with current diarrhea, big belly, lack of appetite, failure to thrive, and so on and so forth. Of course, we don't see this anymore. This is a rare, rare, you know, clinical presentation that, you know, um, it's, it's history, it's part of the past. Right now, this is the real CD disease. So there is a variety of sign of symptoms that can affect somebody with CD disease. It is an inflammatory disease of the GI tract. And as such, of course, can give GI symptoms. But now I believe that it's undisputable that this is a systemic disease, meaning any single tissue organ of the body can be targeted by the inflammatory process activated by gluten. Can be the skin with dermatitis periformis, can be you know, the, um, the, 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 the dental enamel that will become hypoplastic can be the osteo, um, muscle, you know, system with osteopenia, osteoporosis, and so on and so forth. So you see all these sinus symptoms here. Nowadays, the most frequent way that the disease presents itself is not even with GI symptoms, rather with iron deficiency, anemia, and, and fatigue. That's the most frequent way that the disease presents itself in both kids and adults. Of course, GI symptoms remain frequent, but you know this. Uh, this is very telling that you know the coat of celiac disease is changing, and th therefore its presentation is changing. Also, the diagnosis has been changed dramatically over time. You know, at the beginning, we really were where we are right now with non non celiac gluten sensitivity. No biomarkers that were validated. No biomarkers that were robust enough. Now we have the luxury, thanks to the IgA TTG antibodies, to have one of the most robust, you know, uh, screening tests in uh, in uh, human biology because we have sensitivity and specificity that are pretty high, as you see there. So it's really, really robust. Uh, we have also other tests sometimes that we use in those folks that they have IgA deficiency. Uh, and therefore, they would test, you know, falsely negative to the TTG IgA, including TTG IgG. Even more important, the uh, the, the amidated gliadin um, peptide IgG that seems to be performing better than the TTG IgG. As concerned the genetics, uh, because as I told you, ninety five plus percent of people with celiac disease they have either both DQ two or DQ eight. But so does 30, 34%, 30-35% of the general population. We can use the HLA for making the diagnosis. Because if you're tested positive, you don't know if you're among the 99%, 95% celia or the 35% of the general population. It's rather used to rule it out. Because if there are not these genes, the chance that you have celiac disease is pretty much nil. Now, one of the issues is that, you know, following these screening tests, what is necessary is to have a confirmatory test that is an endoscopy with a biopsy that show the autoimmune insult. Something that, again, particularly in pediatrics, has been an object of high active research to try to avoid an invasive procedure. And this very complex, you know, scheme that you see here is the new algorithm that has been proposed uh, by the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition now for a long time to choose a subgroup of individual that eventually can be spared in endoscopy. And if you follow me for a second, this is what it takes eventually for kids with who suspect the the disease to not confirm this by an endoscopy. Starting from the top, you gotta have symptoms, you have to have TTG that is positive, and the positivity of the TTG has to be more than 10 times the baseline. 
So if the cutoff is four, you have to have 40 or more. If you do that, then that will reflect with the test with the antinomism antibodies and the genetics. And if both of them are compatible, then you can make the diagnosis of serious disease without doing endoscopy. All the other scenarios, you go to go through the endoscopy. So that's in a nutshell. Symptoms, TTG 10 times more, the, 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 the cutoff, uh, uh, antinomism and HLA compatible, and that would make the diagnosis. Now, unfortunately, uh, with that said for the diagnosis, the management and, and the monitoring has been an, another challenging situation because, you know, while, as I told you, the TTG antibodies uh, they are very robust for diagnosis, we use them for monitoring, but they don't perform as well. The, their performance, as you see here in this table three underneath there, it's 50-50. So the, the, the sensitivity and specificity is pretty low, and the positive and negative predictive value are less than you know ideal. Meaning that even if we still use, because we don't have anything else, we need to be aware that the TTG by, by itself may not be sufficient to say if somebody in embracing gluten-free diet is doing well in you know taking care of control of inflammation or not. Now, I, I, until now, until the discussion, until the recent past, we were under the impression for any other immune disease that the two key elements that were necessary and sufficient would be genetic predisposition and exposure to environmental factor. In this case, you know, gluten. So much so that if you take gluten out of the picture, the aluminum insult will go away. So that was our premise at that time. Then, uh, you know, we start to dig into more of these two elements, genetics. We discussed about the HLA already, but the HLA is not the end of the story. The HLA accounts over 60% of the um, genetic uh, component of, of in, in inheritance of celiac disease. There is a myriad, probably thousands of genes that combine, they account for the remaining 40%. And for those, we know little. We start, you know, to look into this genetic, you know, uh, complexity of the matter, but it's still complicated in terms of finding that. What about the environmental component? The environmental component is an interesting story. We didn't know that gluten was the culprit until this gentleman, a pediatric uh, uh, pediatrician from the Netherlands, uh, Dr. Dick, uh, you know, uh, um, Dickey, uh, made an interesting in, you know, observation during World War II. I want to remind again to everybody that this not only was a pediatric condition, but the, was a, with high morbidity and mortality. 30, 35% of the kids were dying because of celiac disease at that time. And this gentleman, and, and that time, the only way that to, to handle that was to eventually, if a pediatrician would make a diagnosis, you go to the hospital, they confirm the diagnosis, and these kids were, left, were being left in the hospital for six months, feeding them only bananas. That's the reason why that generation of celiac were called banana babies. And then, you know, eventually they start to reintroduce gluten. And if they relapsed, they would die. Then unfortunately, that, that was their destiny. If on the other hand, they start to tolerate gluten, they were sent home. This gentleman, due to the war, realized that this mortality went to zero. To then resurface the 30, 35% when the war was over. And ask himself, what, is, what was missing during the war that could have been the instigator of seeded disease? Any reason that you know the flour at that time was not made with with uh, flour, rather with potato starch flour, and so for that reason he hypothesized that was gluten containing grains that were the culprit, and did an experiment that of course nowadays cannot be done because more morally unacceptable. Took six of these kids, put on a gluten free diet. Uh, and so that these kids were doing better and then make them sick again by reintroducing gluten. And that's how in the late 40s, the link between celiac disease and gluten was made. Uh, of course, you know, from there, we went on to try to understand, you know, what kind of, you know, um, grains are, you know, the offensive one. And they belong to this tribe of the Ordi where wheat, rye and barley belong to. They are the ones that contain, you know, gluten. Um, now, there is also another interesting situation that, that is a turn of events that we experienced in the past, I would say, decade or so. The two 
elements, gen genetic and, 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 glu and gluten-containing grains that we thought that were necessary, uh, sufficient, turns to be a paradigm that starts to have some problems to be supported. For example, we don't see 100% concordance in monozygote twins. Identical genes, both they eat gluten, but only in 75% of the cases, there is concordance, and the rest in 25%. One you know, a twin has the disease, the other one does not. How's that possible? The age of onset, as we know now, is not as we believe before, just in pediatrics. It's so much so that it's not a pediatric condition anymore. You can come down with this disease at any age. Of course, some people, they have GI issues, but some others, they have skin issues and so on and so forth. So target different tissue and organ and the severity can change from one division to another. But the two elements that put really in uh, you know uh, under scrutiny of the the, the the paradigm gene plus environment necessary sufficient are the fact that prospective studies so following people at risk over time show that some people lost tolerance to gluten and developed the disease after eating gluten with no problem for decades and then you know the epidemiology data, data they see the disease showing an increased prevalence over time as any other autoimmune disease doubling every 15 years. How is this is possible if the two elements coexist and yet you have people that tolerate gluten for a while? And this really brings me to a much more <clears throat> general context of chronic inflammatory diseases and <clears throat> the Western lifestyle. Uh, and, and again, let me remind to all of us that, you know, we as a species for almost the entire totality of a two million years of evolution have been sick and died only by one thing, infections. And then, you know, in the mid 60s, we start to understand that the basic of this infection, we went at war against these microorganisms. And we developed, you know, antibiotics with sanitation of the water, uh, vaccines and so on and so forth. And as a consequence, and only in the Western Hemisphere, where you know these remedies were implemented, this is like rheumatic fever, hep A, TB, mumps, measles, just plummeted. However, during the same period of time, and with a, a, an inverse upward, you know, trend, we saw an increase of chronic inflammatory diseases, including CD disease. Bottom line. If you embrace a, a worse than lifestyle, you don't die fast of infection, you die slowly of uh, chronic inflammatory diseases. Now, if the paradigm genes plus environment equal and sufficient still stands, there are only two explanations here. One is that we have changed the environment too fast for us to adapt because it cannot be genetic mutation. Genetic mutation would take much longer than three, four decades to materialize an increase of this condition. So it's gotta be the environment. But if we look at the same phenomenon with a, a more positive and optimistic you know, view, the consequence of this epidemiologic observation suggests that the fact that I am born with the genes or celiac disease is not destiny that I develop it. If I do or do not, depending on my lifestyle. If I play my genetic cards in the wrong way, as we've been doing in the past few decades in the Western hemisphere, then I accelerate the risk to develop CD disease. If we understand what we've been doing wrong, we can have eventually the key to understand what it takes really to break tolerance to gluten and eventually develop the disease. And that can open a, a, the opportunity of personalized intervention and most importantly, primary prevention so that I don't make that mistake. And therefore, even if I'm genetically predisposed, I don't develop CD disease. That change led to a revisitation of what it takes to develop any disease in humankind, including CD disease. Genes are important, environmental trigger, in our case, gluten is definitely important, but they are not sufficient. It seems that there are at least another three elements at play. These two words are normally segregated by barriers. The ones that is visible is the skin, but the most important is the intestine. So if the intestinal barrier will keep the gluten at bay out of my body, I will be safe. Uh, if it doesn't work anymore, that will start to the match from the genetic predisposition of clinical outcome. Another element, of course, is the immune system. We're talking about chronic inflammatory diseases. So the immune system is doing something wrong, fueling inflammation when it's not necessarily needed. And last and not least, this new component that we knew very little till the recent past that we call the microbiome. So this ecosystem and microorganism that live you know, with us from birth to death, that if 
we establish a friendly relationship, we live in a symbiotic relationship that will be, you know, good for us and good for the macroorganism. But if we are not establish a good relationship that can create the problem that will make me to switch from genetic predisposition to clinic outcome. The last three that I told you are highly interconnected. So if you lose your gut barrier, that causes dysbiosis and vice versa. If the gut barrier doesn't work anymore, gluten comes through, the immune system will see the enemy and will start to be hyperbilligerent and so on and so forth. You got the point there. But the most important things that we realize is the microbiome can decide if, why, when, and how my genes that put me at risk for celiac disease will be switched on or off. And that leads me to start the march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. And that's where there is a lot of attention right now. This scheme is the march from health to disease at the barrier, in this case, the gut barrier, that we're going to walk through very quickly and, and very simply, even if this seems to be cumbersome. Health, number one, left. Disease, number four, right. So if we are in a state of health, everything works fine. So we have the barrier works, the microbiome is in balance, the antigen traffic, including gluten, is tightly controlled, and we maintain what we call a mucosal tolerance state of, of energy, of homeostasis. The problem arises when we go from one to two. There is a break of this barrier, particularly in the space in between cells. Then in the past, we thought that was completely cemented. Now we know this regulated by highly dynamic structures that we call tight junctions that you may consider as a sort of doors. They are almost almost always closed, but because of doors, they can be open when it's needed. But if they got stuck open, stuff, including, for example, gluten, will come through all the time. That instigates the immune system to fight. And if you fight, you have collateral damage that is, called, that is the inflammation. The inflammation is mediated by some chemicals like cytokines that per se can increase gut permeability. And now we will go in this vicious circle, going from two to three, antigen trafficking, inflammation, pro-inflammatory cytokines that increase even more permeability until we break tolerance and we develop a problem. What kind of problem? It depends who we are genetically speaking. If we are predisposed to develop cancer, we, we, we have a certain immune response, allergy, another immune response, autoimmunity like celiac disease, yet another response. The problem that we faced for many, many years was how I go from one to two. So what starts this permeability of the gut? And that's been our contribution with this molecule that is called zonulin, that now has been linked to a, a, a laundry list, not even include, you know, comprehensive laundry list that you see here of chronic inflammatory diseases, including autoimmunity like CD disease. And if you ask what makes zonulin, that is a sort of key that keeps this door open all the time, to be produced in an excessive amount. Among the other stuff, gluten. As you probably know, gluten is a complex of protein. The most studied is this one here that you see here, this cartoon is alpha gliding, but we cannot digest them completely. There are some pieces that are undigestible because we don't have the enzyme to do that. And two of these, the one in blue, are the ones that instigate the cells to release zonulin and therefore to increase gut permeability. And this brings me to the end of my chat. Uh, so talk about a little bit of treatment that will complement your alternative to gluten-free diet. That's the future now. Or even more so, possibility of prevention of celiac disease. So why we need anything out of the gluten-free diet that seems to be so effective? It is, but unfortunately, it's not, the efficacy of the gluten-free diet is not you know, 100% uh, as we believed before. Uh, <clears throat> matter of fact, 30% of people with celiac disease have persistent sinus symptoms, after a year on a strict gluten-free diet without cheating. And these are divided into big groups. Uh, no response to celiac disease, and this is the one that we really focus on to try to find something complementary alternative. And refractory celiac disease, there are two subgroups, one and two, that is a much more complex situation that I'm not gonna over right now because this will take total another talk. Uh, more than 40% of adults with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet, they still have villus atrophy if they repeat an endoscopy. So they, between four and 19% of kids, and particularly in pediatrics, that's a concern because of course a, a, a chronic inflammatory intestine means, you know, also impingement of growth and so on and so forth. Uh, 
This is a landscape of all the clinical trials that up to September um, that are registered uh, related to celiac disease, uh, of which uh, under 12 has to do with pharmacological interventions. This is a landscape where these uh, clinical trials are taking place of. Of course, the vast majority are in North America and Europe. And this in the United States, you see the map where these trials have been taking place. Um, as you probably know, the clinical trials are divided in phases. Phase, phase one is very early to just focus on safety, on health individual. And then you go to uh, phase one, phase two, or phase three that has more to do with efficacy on people with a specific disease. In this case, you know, uh, with celiac disease. The, the highest the number, the more you're close to commercialization. So you see the landscape here. There is only one in phase three. Uh, uh, and and therefore, you know, but many others are coming from phase two close to phase three. And I'm going to finish with prevention. That is something very dear to me. Um, so we have been embarking this study that is called the CD Disease uh, 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 Environmental Microbiome and Metabolome Study of CD GEM as an acronym, in which we took 500 kids at risk for CD disease because somebody in the family had a disease, and we've been following over time monitoring a massive amount of data of their life, their style, the lifestyle of the mother, and so on and so forth, and collecting also more than 120,000 samples uh, to try to figure out what really breaks tolerance to gluten, what, what really makes this situation to eventually start that much for genetic predisposition and clinical outcome. And this is because, as I mentioned before, like many other autoimmune diseases, even CD diseases in rampage, so genes and environments have not been changed in this period. So it got to be something else, and something else seems to be in the, the microbiome. And here, this is our contribution. This was a paper that was published, you know, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, in which we look at the signature of the microbiome way before the onset of the disease. So we're talking about years before the onset of the disease. And with these studies, what we found is that, again, well before that, you know, these kids develop celiac disease, we see signature that highly, highly predict who is going to develop celiac disease down the road. Particularly, we see an increase in the abundance of microbes, pathways, and metabolites that have been previously linked to autoimmune inflammatory disease. And then we see a loss of, you know, component in the microbiome that put a break on inflammation compared to the kids that stay healthy despite to be genetically predisposed because the abundance of these protective microbes in the microbiome has been intact. The other thing that we saw that is also interesting is that in the kids that you know, are destined to develop celiac disease, the level of zonulin, this biomarker of loss of battery function, increased dramatically, uh, you, you see here in red, over time, months again before the onset of the disease, compared to the kids that do not develop celiac disease, whose level of zone is stay flat. And that you know, inclination of the line became even steeper in those kids that took you know, many antibiotics in their first two years of life. So bottom line, the antibiotic treatment increased the level of zone that eventually seems to be a predictor of who break tolerance to develop celiac disease. To summarize what I told you, for what we understand, the steps are the following. The first thing that happened is the imbalance of the microbiome, what we call dysbiosis, that can happen you know, two years before the onset of the disease. So we can predict with 90% plus confidence if we see a specific quote unquote microbiome signature, who is going to develop the celiac disease down the road. Then there is an epigenetic rearrangement, so a reprogramming the mucosa that we didn't have time to go through. And then after that, there is a, a, an increase of the zone and therefore the antigen the trafficking of gluten from the intestinal lumen into our body. And this happened, you know, up to a year and a half before that we see this increase. Then we see the brick of tolerance with this appearance of some specific antibodies that precedes by six, nine months the onset and then the onset. Why I'm saying all this? Because these are all possible targets to eventually try a primary prevention to prevent that these kids will go all the way to break tolerance and develop celiac disease. I want to finish by, again, apologize for the technical issues that I had that made me to start a little bit later than you know planned. Of course, um, 
uh, this is Canada for 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 the for the um, uh, invitation. Uh, the many you know uh, entities that support our studies, and there is a laundry list of people that have been participating in the studies. This is just not exhaustive at all. But most importantly, our kids that participate in our study. You see the picture of our Gemma kids. These are the kids that come and uh, to our labs. Uh, they have a lab, you know, coat graduation ceremony as a sign of participation to this study. And we really enjoy when we see them coming. And with that, I think that I can stop. So let's uh, jump to uh, to questions now for Dr. Fasano. So uh, first, uh, wondering what else can increase the TTG levels in an individual, like uh, the various conditions you mentioned, uh, could they increase levels over 100? And to what degree is a higher TTG more indicative of celiac than a lower one in the absence of a biopsy? I believe that, you know, this was touched upon before, um, but, you know, um, low level of TTG, first of all, there is no direct correlation with the severity of the disease. It's not that you have a you know, low level, you have a, a mild disease, a high level, you have a more severe disease. It's just the specificity of the test that increases. That you have a, a TTG extremely high that can be a false positive is very, very unlikely. That's the reason why this revised criteria. When it's low, it still, celiac disease is the most likely possibility, but there are other, other autoimmune diseases, for example, type 1 diabetes or thyroid issues that can give you a false TTG positive when it's not very, very high. So that's the reason why eventually when you don't have very high level, an endoscopy is still the best way to make sure that the diagnosis is confirmed. Thank you. And uh, speaking of other uh, other conditions, do people with other digestive disorders like uh, IBS, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, colitis and, and such, can they benefit from a gluten-free diet? And is there any risk between an increased, like any link between an increased risk for developing celiac in people with any of these conditions? So um, why 100% of people with celiac disease would benefit going on a gluten-free diet? The percentage of people that would benefit gluten-free diet without a chronic inflammatory disease is not a question of mark. So if, if, the, if the question would be, for example, IBS or, you know, IBD, do they, these people will definitely not benefit, you know, for a gluten-free diet? The answer is no, probably that's not true. And, and if the following question is, okay, so everybody will be eventually benefiting the gluten-free diet. The answer is also not true. In, what I'm trying to say is 100% of people with celiac disease, they respond to the gluten-free diet. They are sensitive to gluten. There are subgroup of these other chronic inflammatory conditions that eventually can have, again, a non celiac gluten sensitivity, which sensitivity that can either contribute to their symptom or even be an instigator of their symptoms and, and the challenge that we have is to find that subgroup that belong to go on the gluten-free diet or not. In terms of, you know, uh, the risk of people with IBS to develop celiac disease or IBD to develop celiac disease, I, I don't think that we have data suggesting that risk is higher than in general population. Okay. And uh, yeah, bottom for anyone out there, uh, child or adult so with celiac disease, uh, good to consult your medical professional before Absolutely. jumping into a gluten-free diet if you, you know, if you don't have celiac. Um, can small intestinal bacteria overgrowth methanogen based uh, give high TTG results? No, uh, that is one of the forms of, of this biosis and per se cannot cause an increase of TTG. What it can cause though, is the beginning of the March, if you're genetic predisposed to have a, a, an elevated um, um, antigen trafficking secondary to increased permeability, for example, zone independent, and that will facilitate gluten to come through. And if you're genetic predisposed, that can cause, you know, uh, an increase in TTG. Okay. And uh, so hypothetical, we all have that friend who's like, uh, I'm going to go gluten-free because it's healthier. It's going to make me skinny, you know, whatever falsehood they push. If someone is not celiac, not diagnosed celiac, they go gluten-free strictly, could they still develop celiac disease or can that not happen because gluten is the trigger? The latter. So if you don't have the, tr the trigger in there, of course, you know, the, you, you would not have the culprit that eventually will lead to the problem. The issue is that, as you said, going gluten-free for medical necessity needs to be guided by a healthcare professional. Cannot be done and give it a try kind of business. So if I have IBS or IBD and I want to, you know, see if gluten will help me or not, you've got to be guided by an healthcare professional. Um, if, on the other hand, you want to do this for 
lifestyle. Uh, of course, you have the freedom to eat whatever you want, including gluten-free. Um, but, you know, again, uh, it's a diet and has some price that you pay for this because, you know, the amount of fibers and vitamins and minerals that you will ingest on a gluten-free diet is less than ideal. And, and I believe that, again, um, I'm not a strong proponent of any kind of diet, uh, gluten-free or otherwise, unless you really talk with a professional, with a good dietitian that would say, okay, if you really, really want to do this, this is the right way to implement the diet. Okay. And on the matter of genes, I think you mentioned uh, something like 95% of people with celiac disease will have the DQ uh DQ2, DQ8, um, is that, uh, is it possible, how, how possible is it to have celiac disease in the absence of those markers? Well, again, the rest of 5%, uh, so it's extremely rare, but not impossible. You know, I, I, without going too much in technicalities, these, uh, these genes are made by two half, what we call um, alpha and beta, where gluten will be accommodated, one deamidated, and present to the immune cells. That's the reason why if you don't have that, you can develop celiac disease. But there are some people that have only half of the dimer, so one half of the dimer. And, and even if it's not ideal, they can still accommodate gluten, but they will be called technically negative on DQ2, DQ8. And that's the reason why I believe we have that 5%, but it's rare. Mm -hmm. Right. And you talked about the revised diagnostic criteria discussed for children with more than 10 times the baseline TTG. Um, I know, will kids that were diagnosed under the SQAN, stand, SQAN standards like be able to access medications when they become available, like for cross-contamination? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. The, the, the honest answer, I don't know. Knowing the healthcare you know, insurances, uh, United States and Canada, they will find anything possible to eventually deny any kind of medication. And um, there is a chance, I'm not sure, but there is a chance that they would deny because there is not biopsy proof celiac disease. Said that, of course, you know, reality like, you know, Celiac Canada and other, you know, support groups has to advocate for those folks in, in case that, you know, something of, of, of a, a new medication will come on the market. And these people will definitely be diagnosed with proper criteria, even without an endoscopy to benefit of that kind of intervention. And speaking generally, do you know? Like, uh, do you feel the medical profession is moving towards greater acceptance of accepting a firm diagnosis without being on gluten? Like a, a lot of adults too cannot. Uh, the the gluten challenge can be traumatic, as you know. Um, not any progress there? We think in the mindset. You know, again, uh, um, the, 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 I, I think that people, well, let me step just for a second. One thing is the science, and one thing is clinical practice. If you're in clinical practice, no matter if you're a doctor, dietitian, or a nurse practitioner, whatever, your primary goal is the well being of your patients, no matter what. And, you know, if you have a patient that unfortunately embraces a gluten free diet without a firm diagnosis, and he or she will tell you, you know, I need to know for sure that I have seen the disease. And, and I have to tell this person, the only way to do that is a gluten challenge. Now, common sense should come on the plate. If that's bearable, I believe there is an advantage to do that because, you know, the, the gluten-free diet for celiac is for life. So you have solid, you know, um, foundations to really make that kind of commitment. But if the pay person would say, listen, I can't do it. I would be really commiserating myself after a few hours, so much so a few weeks that I have to be on, on, on a gluten challenge. At that point, it's the time to really use common sense and say, you know what, fine. Provided that you commit for the rest of your life to not cheat and stay with the program, and because they are very sick, I'm pretty sure you don't have to twist their arm to do that. Uh, you need to use common sense and call that case as a celiac. It's an unfortunate situation because again, um, it happened more often as should because, you know, nobody in any other condition that we face will be daring to in, start an intervention without a diagnosis. Who with diabetes will start to take insulin without consulting a, a healthcare professional? Nobody mm -hmm. will. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I should clarify for anyone out there who's new to the gluten-free world, when we say gluten challenge, we mean you're eating gluten-free, but that can mess with the the results of the blood test and the biopsy. So you go back eating gluten for a few weeks in order to make sure the tests are accurate, but that can be quite uh, quite punishing for your for your body. 
so uh, I'm gonna some questions about associations here. So uh, for for children, can behavioral issues like ADHD, for example, be a consequence of celiac disease or any other neurological uh, links that uh, you could say for children? So as I told you, despite to be a GI inflammation, celiac disease is systemic disease. One organ that you know the immune cells activate against gluten, they love to go after is the brain for reason we don't know. So it's not uncommon that, you know, not only kids, but even adults with celiac disease will have neurological and or behavioral symptoms, including, you know, mood swings, anxiety, depression, ADHD, uh, all the way to schizophrenia or, you know, peripheral neuropathy or worst case scenario, inflammation of the cerebellum that we call gluten ataxia. Um, if well, again, like any other sinus symptoms, celiac disease, they are not specific of celiac. Of course, you know, you can have ADHD for carotenes and other reasons. Um, the only way to make the link is to see what happened to you when you go gluten-free. If that neuroinflammatory process was instigated, the immune cells are activated because it's gluten, that symptom would improve if not completely resolved. If they're independent, you would not see any difference. With the caveat that, you know, with rule with a lot of exception is that while the inflammation the gut tends to go away after a few weeks that you implement correctly the gluten-free diet, it may take much longer for the near inflammation to go away. All right, thanks for clarifying that. Um, if, if say a child is on immunosuppressants for another inflammatory disease, could that reduce the symptoms of celiac? Yes, not only can it reduce the symptoms of celiac, but will reduce also the, the, the reliability of the testing if you have to make a diagnosis and not there yet. But I want to clarify something. You know, if you compare IBD, let's say Crohn's with celiac disease, uh, and, and I have to choose one of the two, I would choose 100% a million times celiac over IBD. For which reason? That with IBD, the only thing that I can do is going after the consequences i.e. the inflammation. I have inflammation and I have to put the brick of inflammation, but I don't go after the cause. Why I'm inflamed, I can't treat with, you know, Crohn's with that because I don't know why. With celiac disease, on the other hand, we have the luxury to know why. So I don't need the, the anti-inflammatory drug that yes, we stop inflammation and will make me feel better, but has side effects and may have not been effective all the time compared to the gluten-free diet that is much more effective. If you, if you allow me a parallel, it's like to say that I have, you know, pneumonia and, and we, with that, I have fever. You know, I can take Tylenol and the fever will go away. But when the Tylenol effect is over, the fever will come back. Why? Because I'm going after the consequence that is the fever, not the cause that is an infection. So out of the, 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 the parallel, with IBD, I, I have no other way to go after the consequence and I put a brick on inflammation. With see the disease, I remove the cause of inflammation by going gluten-free. All right, thank you very much. And uh, this will be our, our last question. You mentioned uh, the proportion of children that, uh, that have celiac disease uh, still exhibit intestinal damage. Even if the biopsy is no longer required for a diagnosis, do you think that all children with celiac disease should have intestinal biopsies done if, if feasible? I would. I mean, you know, not only for what we were discussing before, you know, um, of the future of access to uh, drugs, if you have or not done an endoscopy, but also because, you know, the autoimmune insult is the uh, biopsy that I see after doing an endoscopy. The endoscopy is an invasive procedure by all means, but has very low risk of complication and the return on investment is high. Um, particularly in those cases, in those, the one that have persistent symptoms, as you said before, for which I can answer the question if the symptoms are related to celiac disease or something else. And if it's something else, I got to do an endoscopy anyhow, because I can have an inflammation in the esophagus, an inflammation in the stomach that is due to an allergy or an infection and so on and so forth. So not having a baseline endoscopy and then, you know, symptoms are not gone. I would be forced to do another endoscopy without having the baseline would make my life a little bit complicated as a healthcare professional. 